Greg Lord was probably the alpha male of all the alpha males that we had in that joint. Um, I was the one who called the signals, but Greg was that, he was that guy. You know, Rod was that guy. And man, they, like back then, dude, you had to earn your respect with the players more so than the coaches, right? <laughs> All right, here we go, Up On Game. It presents Conversations with a Legend. And this truly is a legend of mass proportions that I'm super, super, super excited to be a part of and, and do this interview. The one, the only, Mr. Captain L. Kirk. They say T for Star Trekians, but for Stiller Aliens, it's Captain uh, L. Kirk, and that means LaVon Kirkland, the great LaVon Kirkland, middle linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Man, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to to do this uh, this interview with you. Uh, how are you feeling, man? How's everything going? Life? I just seen you in Philadelphia or in yeah. Harrisburg, so we got a chance to link up. Just tell everybody how you're feeling, what you got going on, what's going on in LaVon Kirkland's world right now. Oh, man, such a lot. And thank you so much for having me on the show, man. Thanks for I, coming you know, on. Um, you're like my little brother. Indeed. Um, I really appreciate your enthusiasm toward me. It's, it's funny, but I, I appreciate it, though. Um, <laughs> let's see what I'm doing. I am I'm with the South Carolina Football Hall of Fame. And it's a nonprofit, and we are trying to educate, empower, and encourage our student athletes in the state of South Carolina. So that's one thing that I do. I do a couple podcasts. I'm actually going back to school to get my master's in psychology. Uh, I am writing a book, a book called Thank You, and it talks, um, it really shares my gratitude toward people, places, and experiences. So I'm doing a great deal, man. I feel good. I've been working out with a great trainer named Jimmy, and I've cut out sugars in my diet, so we're good to go, baby. I love it. I love yeah, it. Man. All right, so you mentioned the South Carolina Hall of Fame. Obviously, you're a Clemson great. Now, let's let's start, let's start here. Um, and and we'll talk about we'll get to Legends program and and your involvement. Are you even involved? Are you involved with the Legends? Are you up on the Legends program? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that because um, I love to plug the Legends program just because there's so many of us that need a voice and need a platform and need to be heard because it's so much wisdom that just is going unheard and and so this was why I started this this show this series to be able to capture and collect the 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 stories the the information that we can pass on to not only the the next guys up but to actually let people know that we're still relevant we're we're still brands that are investable you can still monetize you know what we got going on they just need to know what we got going on so let's let's start at the beginning now it's only been Orlando Pace Shots out to the to the goat of of Lyman uh, that has been a high profile guy coming out of high school uh, from Leonard Williams to Thomas Davis uh, Senior uh, to you name it Mike Rucker guys have have been virtually uh, obscure not very highly touted or recruited coming out of high school um, making it to the next level. What was your high school situation like? I know you're from South Carolina. Now, is it small or or is it yeah. is it okay? So you come from a small area too. Super now, small. Carolina is a hotbed for football because most everybody I didn't talk to didn't come from somewhere in the mm -hmm. Carolinas. Yeah. So just tell me a little bit about what your background was and and what was your your uh, journey to uh, to college. Well, you know, I come from great. Great parents, hardworking parents. You know, my parents start off as sharecroppers, actually. Mm. Um, <clears throat> four sisters, three brothers, and we're from a really small town. One traffic light, you can run your 40 
in Lamar, South Carolina, and you'd be finished, man. Wow. Very small town. One uh, Well, we were 2A when I played and just wasn't really getting any re- really looks. I was the youngest of, um, um, I'm the youngest of the, of the boys. And I just fell in love with football. My bro- all my brothers were really good athletes, but I really didn't get an opportunity to go to the next level. And I thought one day I was throwing a ball around my backyard. I caught it and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play pro ball one day. Went to high school. Uh, <laughs> and my coach called me in in the 10th grade year. My father, you gotta know my father was really strict. So I had to ask, ask to go to practice every day. Wow. He was a minister. So I had okay. to ask to go to practice. Had every to day. ask permission to practice. To go to practice and right. the games. Right. And so and, and let's day, let's be clear here now. Because yeah. I'm a preacher's kid too. That permission was to make sure you didn't have to clean up something or or mow the grass or right. or, or or like so I, I understood that very clearly. Yeah, man. So it's all about prioritizing. As long as you ain't got something to do around what we got going on in God's house, you can right. go practice. That's it. That's it. So <laughs> so I didn't so one time I didn't ask my father to go to practice. And so I missed I miss uh, a practice and uh, my head coach called me in and he had a little stern talk with me. He said, like, you know, we had a jamboree. He told me that I wasn't going to play in the jamboree because I didn't come to practice. And I'm like, and I was like, well, I have to ask my father. I, I didn't see him. He said, that's your responsibility. So I was like, OK, cool. But he told me, he's like, but LeVon, if you commit to this game, you can go to the next level. That's all I need to hear. And um, I did get recruited very highly. I got discovered. You know, back then, there wasn't really any internet. News traveled a lot slower back then. And the, the, the way I got recruited was there were some recruits looking at another guy from the other team that we were playing in the playoffs. And my coach came to me and he said, you know what? There's some recruits outside. And I was like, that's all I need to know. Had a fantastic game. Next week, got a letter from the University of South Carolina. Then got a letter from Clemson because Clemson must have heard that South Carolina was recruiting me. And so that's how my recruiting um, journey started. But Clemson did a better job as far as the relationship. And you know what? They were really honest with me. They didn't promise me anything. Uh, the guy, the guy that recruited me, Coach Aldridge, he was just like, I just think you're a, a hell of an athlete. And I think, you know, I, I just want to be able to get you, give you a chance. I said, like, that's all I need. And so he came back to my house and he was the first one to offer me a scholarship in front of my parents. And I have to tell you, man, my parents, you know, they didn't go, they didn't finish high school. They didn't, you know, so they certainly didn't go to college, but they made a way for all my other brothers and sisters to go to college. They paid for all my older brothers and sisters to go to college, but they didn't really know about the student athlete part of it. Um, And so they came into the house, man. And my father was amazed that I could go to school for free by playing football. He thought it was a child's game. He wasn't really into it, but my mother was into it. So it's kind of how my journey started, man. I'm not very highly recruited. Uh, Danny Ford barely knew who I was going into the door. It, it was one of those things. I was from a small town, wasn't quite developed, was a very good athlete though, but <laughs> just was, you know, just not on the radar, just not a big time kid. Now you were six one. How many pounds coming out of high school? You're going to be amazed when I tell you this. I was only 205 pounds. Okay. Come which is legit which is legit for uh safety or uh, yeah. a weak well, side matter backer fact, matter of fact they were going to put me at safety because i mm-hmm. put in in high school i did everything um as far as i returned punts i returned kickoffs wow i played tight end split in and i played outside linebacker also i played on a basketball team and i ran track i high jumped six six in track wow yeah man I that's ran the explosive I ran the 400 and I ran the mile relay. Okay, so let's talk about that. 
Because I always say this whole specializing culture is destroying our youth. I too played basketball. I too ran track. I too played quarterback, running back, receiver, cornerback, safety. I did I did everything. And and I always say the best linebackers played basketball and generally played tailback or some sort of sport where there was movement involved with what it is that you were doing, hand-eye coordination. So how much did doing those other positions and those other sports play a part in your development? Oh, man, it, it was tremendous. It really was. I, I, I think when I got to Clemson, they were uh, a little amazed how, how I could move and how mm-hmm. quick I was. But I really give it all to playing those other sports. I really believe basketball was a big contributor of me being able to cover when I got to the pros and I, mm. when I was in college. I mean, just being able to run around screens, understand um, positioning, understanding angles. And that was because I played basketball. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. you understand, you know, getting between the ball and the basket. Mm-hmm. Just those simple fundamental mm-hmm. concepts were there because I played other sports. I think track really helped with endurance and understanding how to run. You'll be amazed how many kids don't really know how to they run. They don't know how to you run know, these days. That's correct. They, they don't even know the technique of running. Yeah. And, uh, you know, football, you know what football brings to the table as well. But I really feel because I was an all-around athlete that it helped me transition to just only playing football. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. So – and that's that's pretty dope. So so you get there, you don forty four. So you was always a double number dude. Like you wore forty four in college. Was that was that the thought process when you got ninety nine in the league? Like I was forty four. Can you could have and you could have actually wore forty four in the league because linebackers could wear forty four. But I, I I'm assuming the tradition of of Pittsburgh, you wasn't going to be allowed at that time to wear 40. I'm just assuming, but right. what, how did that come about? Well, you know, I was wearing number 45. Okay. During the preseason when I, uh, when I got, you know, that first year, and then the equipment guy called me in and said, we got to change your jersey. So mm-hmm. I think back then you couldn't wear 40 numbers. Okay. You so it evolved. it evolved. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it evolved. Okay, because when we, and I came in, you actually, at linebacker, could wear 40. Yeah, but okay. during my huh. time, you couldn't wear any 40 numbers. Okay. Like you can only wear 50, 90 and 50s. 90s and 50s. Okay. So I got in there and they had four numbers laid out for me. Huh. They had 58, 59, 56, and 99. So. You ain't wearing no 58. I'm not wearing no 58. You ain't That's Jack wearing Lambert's no. Number. Yeah, man. Yeah. I'm not wearing, I'm not wearing 59. 59. That's Jack Ham's number. That's Ham's number. Yeah, those things are untouchable, right? Right. There, there's not really a rule that you can't wear, it, but there's a rule that you can't wear. It. Yeah. So it comes down to 56 and 99. And I'm looking at 56, and I'm like, man, there's a lot of dudes that wear 56. Or 56, yeah. Lawrence Taylor was one of my favorite guys, you know yeah. what I'm saying? uh-huh. So there was a lot of dudes wearing 56. Then I looked at 99. And I was like, I was number 44 in college. I said, 99 is kind of dope. Nobody's really wearing that number. Not Especially at that, not at that position. Yeah. Not, yeah. At inside backer, nobody's wearing 99. And I told them, I'm going to get 99. And they were like, oh, all right. They didn't care. So I go to practice, man. I'm wearing 99. They was and the guys are on looking you. at me. They was Joan. They had the Joan on. They it. were like, dude, 99. And guess what I told them about? I had so much. I, I was a very confident guy. I All was right. like, don't worry. It's going to grow on you. All right. It it's just it did. You. It certainly did. But yeah, y'all was yeah. all different, though. Like, G. Yeah. Lloyd had that uh, that big old plastic mask. Yes. Like, y'all was yes. just different dudes all together anyway. So, 99 yeah. fit. 99 fit. But the crazy thing was, in our in when we were just really good, man, especially that 94 season, we all wore 90 numbers. It just kind of like Chad, Chad came in. Um, in 93, he had 94. Kevin came in the same year. He had 91. 
Then Brenton Buckner, he came in. He got 96. Joel Steed came in the same year. Yeah. He had 93. Dang. And then Ray, Ray Seals came in big 97. Dang. So that whole defense, that front seven, was all, all 90s. 90s <laughs> it, it. <laughs> Boy. Hey, we were cold, man. You preach a gospel. That 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 I mean oh, that was so cold, cold as cold. ever. Cold as ever. Yeah. Um what was that like, man? Oh, Ta- take amazing. me take me into yeah. take me into that meeting room. Take me into that locker room. What the weight room? What the pre- what was that like with those personalities? Uh man, you well, you know we had Ron Wilson, Carnell Lake. Uh, Darren Perry and DP. Deion Figures, man. Yeah, Figures. And the thing about that, Greg Lord was probably the alpha male of all the alpha males that we had in that joint. Um, I was the one who called the signals, but Greg was that, he was that guy. You know, Rod was that guy. And, man, they, like back then, dude, you had to earn your respect with the players more so than the coaches, Right. You know, like, cause we that's talk a about good this. word. Yeah, we that's talk a about good it. word. Yeah, go ahead, go, go ahead, talk on, speak on uh, it now. Me, you on, you on something? Let me tell you something. The coach, you know, the 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 front office and the coaches, they might have drafted you, but you had to earn your respect with the players because G. Lloyd and Greg, and no, G. Lloyd and Rod Woodson would not let you on that field unless you met their standards. So forget the defensive coordinator, who we had, Dom Capers, then we had Dick LeBlanc. If Rod and G. Lloyd did not approve of you, you weren't playing with that team. They would, call, they would call you out like that. That's how it was, man. They would call you out. You had to really earn your respect as a player on that team, especially if you're talking about playing linebacker at Pittsburgh. Dude, you had to be a player, man. And we took ownership of defense. We believed wholeheartedly in what defense was supposed to be about. Aggressive, uh, proactive. And then we had that Blitzburg thing going on, that fire zone defense. And nobody knew where we were coming from, man. That's when that's when quarterbacks were still under center. And, man, we were feast. Man, I think we had like 55 sacks that year. Everybody got, um, everybody got sacks on that team. Even the cornerbacks got sacks on that team. Dude, it was no joke, man. We, we had so much pride as far as defense is concerned. And then you take the linebacker position. That linebacker position was serious, man. Mm-hmm. If you're going to be a ever. Pittsburgh Steel, best ever. Oh, thank you. It's okay. Much. No, I, it's I okay to say it. it's yeah. the best ever. And some people may be able to debate it. You know, the whole like we talked about Sam Mills and, and Pat Swillen and those guys. I get that and I understand it. Some may bring up Baltimore um, and in 2000. That's the greatest Pittsburgh and that 94 group is the greatest assembly of 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 linebackers ever and and the dudes y'all had on on reserve yeah <laughs> like we had yeah, jason gill, jay gill was jay gill was on the bench yeah. and he ended and up being gill a was, perennial all pro i think jay gill almost i think jay gill leads all outside linebackers at pittsburgh as far as sacks are concerned wow so so yeah man we had that kind of pride but then we would watch film together kevin green was the guy that made us watch extra film KG. And so, like, me and Chad were young guys. We played outside backer in college. They moved us inside because they felt like we wanted a better athlete at the inside position. So both me and Chad played outside, then we transitioned to the inside. And we all were different, but we all were, and I'm not the same same as saying this, man, we were all dogs, man. We all could make plays, man. It was it, it was good because it helped you become a professional. And you, we learned from Kevin and Greg. But, man, me and Chad were that those young guns that you needed, those, that, those energy guys, those guys. Like, everybody was always shocked that I could cover. Let's go into that. Because yes. cause the, one thing about, uh, the one thing about you 
and Chad, Chad's spin move is the most. People like Dwight Freeney's, but Chad, Chad Brown's, his, his spin move was the most ignorant, not eager, not ignorant, ignorant. That was the most ignorant spin move ever. Athletically speaking, Chad wasn't a big daunting size dude. He was like, he was like slim, but his movement was phenomenal. Then you on the opposite end of the spectrum, you on like Brolic mode. <laughs> but y'all doing but y'all doing things that your coverability and your ability to to run down the 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 runner was unmatched. There there were very few dudes that could get to the ball carrier and cover in space the way that you did. And people marveled at at your size. So it's like you got two opposite ends of the spectrum but yet the same type of athletic ability that y'all were bringing to the table. What, I mean, what was, what was that like? Uh, it was a beautiful thing, man. I mean, you know, I came in the year before Chad, we started at the same time. So we were, we were really young that 93 year and we had to kind of adjust to the game a little bit, but boy, we adjusted that 94 year and me and Chad were always kind of like on the same page. We understood each other very well. We were opposites, like you said. We were total opposites, but we played together so well. And any kind of fire zones we did as far as inside cross, it worked perfectly. And I was the guy that, if you didn't know any better, you thought I was just a run stopper. But what the defense and Coach LeBeau and Don Capers understood that, hey, man, this guy at 260, 270 can carry tight ends all the way down the field. And that was the time. And that was a golden age for tight ends. Right. I mean, there was, especially even in the AFC North, but just all together, there were a lot of really good tight ends that were out there. A lot of good tight ends. And And receiving tight ends, too. Right. And so they depended on me to not only be able to stop the run, blitz, but they knew I could cover and and I can finish at the end by making interceptions. So I was unique um, probably at from, I always say this about myself. I felt like I was a very unique linebacker that could do everything. And um, maybe not the media covered me that well, but my fellow players, my colleagues, they knew the deal. They knew the deal. I, I had a lot of guys come up to me. It's like, man, we still can't believe you cover guys the way you do, man. It's, that's amazing. But I really contributed to just being a really, you know, being able to play all those sports that I played in high school. And I understood the game as well. I did. But then also, I had great teammates, man. The, like Greg and Kevin really lift me and Chad up. They really did. And it was a demand on that defense. Like, dude, you cannot step on that field with us unless you were a G. Unless you were a cold stone dude, you couldn't play. I don't know if that's that way now, but you, you're in that era too where, like, man, it was the, the players. You, like, if you, didn't get the, if you didn't get the respect of the players, you didn't have respect. That's right. At all. That's yeah. right. Yeah. All right, let's transition because I want to I – wanna, I want to talk about the idea of this whole NIL thing coming to life, the naming image likeness um, conversations. You were a very noticeable, you stood out player in college. You stood out in the pros. Being able to build a brand, what would you say to to aspiring athletes and guys that are even in college and high school as it applies to understanding what their brands represent because now this name image likeness scenario that's that's playing out and is going to continue to develop and take shape is really all about those who are prepared to be able to understand what their brand is and how that brand is most monetizable if you had that in your day, how would you have handled the situation? And what would your advice be to, you know, the guys that are out there right now? 
you know, before the NIL even came out, I had a talk with the Clemson University football team um, a couple of years ago. And I even talked about, hey, you're your own brand. You're your, com- you're your own company. Even back then, I was addressing that same thing where probably a lot of people were not addressing that. Because once you get into the NFL, you understand a little bit better. We, we really did not have those conversations at Clemson back in those days. How, and I mean, let's be honest, you know, as an African-American, we knew very little about what networking was. My father was a barber and he networked with a lot of people. And he really taught me about not burning bridges, creating relationships. So I would say the same thing, but I would try to address it earlier. I think when you get into high school and college, you know, guys get into their habits. They already have their circle of friends. I I think we need to address this even earlier when we talk about what is branding? How do you brand yourself on social media? How do you give yourself the best outlook? How do you want to run your company? Um, One of the things that really, that how Clemson got me was, they showed my jersey and they had Kirkland on the back of it. You know, in high school, we didn't have that. I saw that name and I was like, I got to make good with my family, um, my, my small town, the kids that are following after me. And so I knew that I had to always represent the Kirkland namesake. And I, I will always tell people, look at your last name. And how do you want that name to be represented as you go on into the future years? How do you want your brand to come across? So I would tell them that basic information. Now, there is a lot of information out there for kids to get on how to capitalize on social media. Uh, My daughter is an artist and she does like uh, art on clothing. I automatically, like, I don't want you working at McDonald's. I don't want you doing in that. I want you to do your own business, do your own branding. Does she have a Sign. website? Does she have a website? Uh, she doesn't have one yet, Social but she's media. just starting on it. But yeah, I, I would tell them about creating their own website. I would really, I think we need to teach more so about branding and how to do it on social media and how to mm-hmm. capitalize it. Mm-hmm. I would first kind of tell them that, but, you know, the common sense thing would be like, that's your last name. You got to, re- you know, if anything, represent yourself well. Understand what, you, what you're worth. Because a lot of times, even as older professionals, we don't really understand what we're worth. I come from a very humble background, and I was just humble about it. You, you know, when you saw me, I'm kind of yes. like, uh, come on, bro. Come on. Whatever. Right. But I had yeah. to realize, like, hey, man, especially after I got my name on the stadium at Clemson. When I saw that, I was like, okay, now you have a real big That's responsibility. Real. Yeah. Like that Kirkland name, you were talking about your father, mother, mm-hmm. grandmothers, mm-hmm. grandfathers. So you got to represent that name. And also my great nieces, my great mm-hmm. nephew, and all down the line. Mm-hmm. So I would say, man, you really got to really take charge of it, but you also got to take pride in it. And you also got to be the director on how you want it to go. Mm -hmm. All right. So now you talked about humble beginnings and and how that played a part in how you viewed, you know, the whole idea of this NIL situation. I guess my next question would be, if I were to tell you, being LeVon Kirkland from where you came from and making it into Clemson and playing the way that you did, was going to lead to you going to have a pro career and to to make pro bowls, to be an all pro, and you were going to make a, a ton of money, but money was going to change everything. How would LeVon Kirkland now respond to the fact that <laughs> money is going to change everything? Yeah. LeVon yeah, says you, what? Wow. I, I mean, like, man, that is, that is so oh – how can I describe it? you don't realize how much money is going to change everything. Uh, I, I felt like I was the same person, but 
now you're take. I was the youngest of all the. Well, I was the youngest boy. I have a little sister. Now it kind of flips. They it's all your everybody. kids now, huh? They become all your kids. Everybody that's ever owed, everybody that's ever gave you five dollars, they're looking for interest on the five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who's helped you out, now you gotta. Now you're the go, Levon. Yeah, go, Levon. The- uh, I need, I need, I'm gonna need fifty thousand. Because yeah. I was saying go Levon for one game, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, now people that they, they're looking upon you to get them out or to save them or to pay on their house or it, it's a lot of responsibility. And I was just a kid that just wanted to play ball, man. That's, that's all I wanted to do, man. I wanted to play ball. I wanted to be big time. But now – you you t- turn into the patriot of your family <laughs> and other families and cousins and it's a lot of pressure and uh, you you have to be able to you have to be able to put boundaries um, out there is that what you and, would tell the younger Levon Kirkland uh, what I would, would what young- would today's Levon Kirkland tell that Levon Kirkland once you get this money young buck this is how this is exactly what you need to do. Well, I would tell, I would first tell the younger Levon not to feel guilty because you worked hard for it. Mm -hmm. You did what was required and you sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So don't feel guilty because your dream, your vision led you to this and it happens to pay you a great deal of money. Do not feel guilty about that. Also, Understand, even if it's family, you must put down barriers. And and you got to put up some boundaries because people will cross that line. And they will ask you like you're the bank, that you owe them something. And all, all honesty, I believe I believed in taking care of my parents, so I did that because they took care of me. I believe in taking care of my brothers and sisters to a certain certain way. I pay for my sister's college, which I never regret that. But then you have others that come in and they try to capitalize and they try to make you feel a certain way. You know, if you didn't, if you didn't comply to what they want you to comply to. So I had to learn and I would tell the younger LeVon, hey man, this is your money. Be wise about it. Set boundaries. And um, don't feel guilty about it because I was the one that was that had the vision, you know, mm-hmm. and I was the one who was willing to while some of my friends were doing something else. I was willing to do the you work were sacrificing. Right? Yeah, I was willing to, you know, you know, I didn't party in high school, really, even in college. I was willing to do that for what I want, for what I wanted. And, so and no that- guilt. it should not be any guilt in that. In that moment, in those moments of sacrifice, do you have one moment that stands out for you more than another that was like a defining moment? Like, I can ball, I'm going to ball. Dad, I hear you on asking you about practice, but I'm going to be at practice, soldier. Uh, Mom, you know, everybody, sis, bros, you know. I'm going to be doing this football thing. Did you have any moment like that was a defining moment where you was like, this is it. Like, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. And and I know I can do it. Well, I tell you, when I was 11 years old, I I was throwing the ball around and I was like, I'm going to play pro football. And that was my moment. I was like, I have no doubts about it. It seemed like it, it came from God. It was a affirmation that I gave, gave myself. But you know what I did? I protected that thing like it was gold. So I didn't really tell anybody about it because being the younger sibling, a lot of times you would get teased a lot, just the nature of it. And if I knew if I would have said something about playing pro ball, They'd have been like, they man, get out of here. They'd have been like, man, shut your face up. <laughs> right, 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 right. And I knew, even then I knew that I could not have any doubts about it. That I had to protect it. And it wasn't until I got to high school 
when my coach told me, I believe you can go to the next level. And I was like, that's it. He confirmed in me what I knew. He was the first one to say, I think you can play to the next level. And I was like, got it. But it happened again, LeVar. When I went to college, I was a red, I got red shirted. I'm just lifting weights. I'm really kind of new to lifting weights. And one of the grad assistants came up to me. He was like, he's like, kid, you keep working the way you work. You're going to be one of the best linebackers ever played here. Wow. And I was like. Prophetic. You got it. I didn't, you like, you know, like most people, when they're given a compliment, how some people will back off from that. Oh, right. this old dress, uh, my hair, you know, this old you thing. You ate it up. I, and, you know, they talk about the positive wolf and the negative wolf. Indeed. And which one to feed. When he told me that, I was like, you got it. I'm yeah. going to be one of the best linebackers ever played this joint. And I was totally off the radar. Nobody looked at me that way. That guy who saw me on the scout team recognized it and said, dude, keep working the way you work. You're going to be the best, one of the best linebackers to play at Clemson. Wow. And I was like, I was like, you got it. I was like, yep, I'm going to be one of the best linebackers ever played. You were there with B-Doc, right? Uh, B-Doc was a year. Um, I actually left when he came Right in. before he was coming out, right before when he came Before he in. was there. Uh, we, we had, a, you know, we were the number one linebacker group uh, my junior year. We had the number one defense in the nation um, wow. 1990, my junior year. So we had some players, man. We had guys like Wayne Simmons, Ed McDaniel was on that yes, team. Chester yes. McLaughlin was on that team. Chester Big Buster. Chester. Woo. Yeah, Chester was a monster, man. Woo, big old played, head. Just think of, think at one point in time at Clemson, we had myself at outside backer, Chester McLaughlin, and Ed McDaniel on the same side. Golly. Good googler, moogler. <laughs> so nobody uh -huh. was getting anything on us. Let, let, let me... Let me hit you with this one. Okay. What does legacy mean to you? Because I've heard you mention, you know, your your last name and and understanding what that means and how much that matters and carrying on that legacy and creating a tradition. You have ultimately made your last name matter more than what it did before you did what you've done. And – as you move forward in life, like we was moving around, we the walking wounded at this at this point. Like if you played this game the way that we played it, we could look good. Our parents can be nice, but we banged up. Like there's 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 wounds and 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 there's there's the scars of of being in. I call it the Serengeti. If you if you understand it, you understand it. Once you roam that Serengeti to actually come out. And not be banged up is is just it's you know it is what it is uh, you know enter at your own caution your own discretion, um, but now it's a legacy. You've done the hard work. You 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 put that in, but now there's life that's being lived, and you've gone through a lot. I mean, you have endured a lot since since playing the game. What is your ultimate legacy? What what do you want to be remembered for? What do you represent that matters the most when when it's that last time where people are given, you know, these are the words that are going to ring in history when we bring up LeVon Kirkland's name? Okay, I got three words, man. And I came up with this maybe a couple of years ago. I want to be known as a person who educates empower and encourage people that's what i want my legacy to be that i reach thousands and thousands of people and i try to be a resource a network to those people now one of the things that i don't well at my small high school 1a high school we after i played we had five we have four other guys now, this is a school that's not bigger than 300 people. We've had four other guys that went on to play pro ball. John Abraham, which you probably know very well, he went, um, a guy named Mike Hamlin, a guy named Marshall McFadden, and a guy that um, recently played B.J. Goodson. 
And then there's another guy that plays at South Carolina State now, Kobe Durant, that may have an opportunity to play. So from that, I want, believe it or not, when I was in high school, when I went to Clemson, man, nobody knew where Lamar was. Nobody. So I, tr- I, I was the one like, there's going to be other guys to follow after me. So when I played in the NFL, I would go back home and I would stay in Lamar at my parents' house because I wanted other kids to see it. I wanted them to see it. And once they saw it, they'd be like, if that dude that lives on 320 Lincoln Circle is playing in the NFL, then I can do it. I can do it. That's the biggest key. Yeah. And when John Abraham did it, I was like, yes, what I set out to do happened. That's all right. Now, if you ask anybody in South Carolina now, where's Lamar, South Carolina? Yeah. They have definitely heard of it. I know that's right. Because now that program is a program is such people recognize the name. Yeah. And I wanted to start that when I was playing ball at Clips. I mean, at Clemson because nobody knew where Lamar was. Nobody. But all my brothers, all my brothers, cousins, they were all good athletes, just never got the opportunity. When I got that opportunity, I was like, I'm going to open the doors up for recruiters to say like, and I used to tell guys at Clemson, I used to tell the coaches at Clemson, every 10 years, go down to Lamar, South Carolina, and you're going to find you a diamond in the rough. And it's happened. It's happened. So that's that's the kind of legacy I wanted to leave um, football-wise. Otherwise, I wanted to leave people with something like, you know, to, like I said, educate, empower them, and encourage them. Because honestly, there was no guys that I knew coming up that played ball that was mentoring me. There was nobody I knew, you know, they weren't mentoring at that time. Our, you know, our generation, me and yours, we understand it better. We want to like, hey, let me give back. Let me, all this knowledge and experience I got is not just for me, it's for others. It's for others. It's not. Um, and I, I, I believe that God intended it that way. That we, our job now is to educate, empower, and encourage other folks. If we're not doing that, then we're not, we're not doing our job. That's right. That's right. Talk to me about the Legends community and, and what, you know, your, your thoughts on it and, and, and just how you feel. Amazing, man. Because, because our player day, playing days are over, it doesn't mean we're not relevant and that we can't give back in a strong way. And you don't have to be a commentator or uh, a famous head coach in order to do this. Um, it took a lot of sacrifice and know-how. And what I call back in my day, man, it was survival, dude. You know, nobody was, <laughs> nobody in the, on your team was like, come on, young guy, you can do it. You had to kind of like get it yourself, man. You had to learn. And a lot of times, like you were, you had to pick and choose your mentors on the team. You had to look at guys and like kind of mimic what they do. I think now we're willing to give that back and we're willing to network. And that's what that community means to me, man. It means that we're able to spread our own personal message locally and also receive globally from other people like me and you connecting. I mean, it's an amazing thing. You know, um, I had no idea that you thought of me that way as a player. I had no idea. And, and us meeting together, man, it was like, man, this little, this guy, man, is like my little brother, man. I don't, you know, I don't have little brothers, but I have little brothers, you know, <laughs> Biologically, I don't have little brothers, but I have little brothers all over, um, all over the world. But yeah, man, like that connection. Yeah, you. Know, you I mean, big, you right? talked about those three things in your legacy. Your legacy helped birth Levar Arrington. 
You know, that linebacking core, as I mentioned to you when we were talking, was the most influential to me in my entire career. I told you, I patterned myself after after Greg Lloyd. Greg Lloyd is my favorite player of all time. Like, that's uh, hands down. Greg Lloyd, Greg Lloyd is a monster, man. He I thought I was – It should be in the Hall of Fame. He should be in the Hall of Fame. And really your name should be. be, and your name should be up for the Hall of Fame, and Thank Chad you. Brown's name should be up for the Hall of Fame. Every last one of those guys from that linebacking core should be on the ballot and being considered for the Hall. That's just that's just factual. That's just what it's supposed to be, and that's just how it should be. It, what you guys did for the game was tremendous, and and again, I was there every step of the way. Ninety three. I'm a freshman in high school. Right. I'm afraid we won state championship. We went 15 and 0 at North Hills High, out where y'all lived. Y'all lived out in Ross Township or at little in McCandless. And I, I used to, y'all had no idea. I used to see y'all walk through Ross Park Mall. I used to see so many. I used to see y'all. And I always tell the story. It's funny. As I got older, I was a basketball player first, but football was, I had to play football because that's what it had to be. But I remember playing in a basketball game where we played a charity game. I played with the postal service. I, w- I was a ringer for the postal service as as a, a a junior in high school, and we played against the Steelers and Stowe Rocks. And I did your boy Earl Holmes. So, I did him so dirty on that hoop court. Uh, but to me, it was just. Even Earl and 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 seeing even when I got to college and when I got to the league, I'm watching Kendrell and I'm watching you know Foot and I'm watching Potsy, watching Ferrier. It, it 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 is tremendous the legacy that was started. You mentioned Ham and Lambert. You know the White White was someone that lived in my community. So when I would be running, I would see the White White when I would be running. And he, you know, come here, kid. And I'd go in, and it was like some Mufasa type stuff. And Simba, like, he would, he, he, after he, the, he would see me running and he talked to me. And then he started inviting me in. And one time he invited me in, and he had his Super Bowl rings on the table when he brought me in the house. And I put the joint on, on God, I could fit it on my middle and, and my, my ring finger. Like it went, it went, it went down the hair, went down there, went down the hair. And I just remember to myself, like, I am going to try on a Super Bowl ring. Every time I come across one, I'm putting it on until I get one. I will not go watch a Super Bowl unless I'm playing in it. I still have not pulled myself to go on the watch because I have two sons. So I'm still holding steady that even though I never got a Super Bowl appearance like you, I never got a runner-up ring. I never got a Super Bowl ring. I'm hoping that one of my babies, there is a little LeVar, I'm hoping that my time to go see a Super Bowl will be one of them playing in it. But to that point, just the inspiration, like you said, I educated myself and I was inspired by you and all those things you said because I wanted to be like y'all. Everybody talked about how smart LeVon Kirkland was as a football player and the field general and the captain, Captain Kirk. Like, I always wanted to be the guy that is like, he's smart and he understands it. So I always, always watched film like to nauseam. Like, like how Biggie said, I used to play the uh, tape till the tape popped. Like, I used to play them VHS cassettes watching film till the tapes popped. And that was the, the the mentality of it for me. So, man, I just want to say thank you for, for all that you did and the influence that you had. Because it, it, without guys like you, like that, yeah, you put Lamar on the map. But you know what? You put LeVar on the map, too. You put a lot of other guys. I mean, I'm sure I'm speaking... For all of us, from B. Short and, and all the other guys, Ron Graham, all the great linebackers that played high school ball, high school football players in general, you know, we were inspired by guys like you, you know, and that that was, you know, that was the thing. That was our DNA, was being hard-nosed yeah. linebackers. Uh, you know, it's amazing now that I'm 52 years old and I still get those compliments 
um, not only from you, but a lot of guys who's like, man, I watched you play. And a lot of times I was, I would downplay my career a little bit, but I mean, to have people to always come back and show you the respect, that's the ultimate honor that you can get when you do something very well. And that's why I feel so strongly about giving back is because um, I, I was kind of in my time, in my, in my hometown, kind of a pioneer. Nobody was thinking about going to that high of a level in athletics. I really took it to heart. And I understand that, man, I wish there were some lessons that I could have gotten from it but, um, before. But you know what? I feel like, man, I can give those lessons back. And we can talk about being uh, more versatile than just being an athlete, you know, taking that beyond the sport. Because we, as we both know, the sport is a, it's a shell life, but it teaches you so many great things and you can take it and you can go beyond the stars with it. So I, I, I thought it was always my responsibility to, to do that, to give back. And I, I was that guy that, even if they drafted a guy that was supposed to take my place, I was always willing to give back to that guy and help him out and give him some know-how. I even helped guys on the, um, on the other side of the ball office. There was always just one story about me in the tight ends room. And every time a new guy would come in there, Mark, um, Mark Bruner and Mike uh, Malarkey, the coach, they would tell all the tight ends, Hey, you can't beat number 99 deep. Can't beat them deep. And so, you know, these young guys come in looking at my size and thinking like, oh, I can get him easily. I, I know I can beat him. So every time they be running deep, man, I'm running stride for stride with them. And they're like, what? So they're just like, what the hell, man? And Bruno is like, I told you, man, you cannot beat this dude deep. So one guy was smart enough after practice, man, tied in, he was a rook. He said, hey, uh, hey, LeVon, man. I was like, what's up? He's like, um, how do we beat you deep? And I was like, you know what? You're the first person to ever asked me that story. I was like, I'm glad you asked me. And I said, it's hard to beat me deep. It's hard to beat me on routes because what people didn't know, what you just said, I was incredibly disciplined as a player. I would not. I will only give you what I wanted to give you. So if it was cover two, you weren't going to beat me deep. I would not allow you to beat me deep. If it was cover three, oh, I'm going to get you underneath. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm going to deliver you because I know I got that help over top. Yeah, I'm going to make you do exactly what I want you to do. Yeah. I said, it's your job to be creative in your routes. Mm -hmm. I said, if you're not creative in your routes, you'll never be. Wow. Never. So I, even I gave back to the offensive side. But yeah. he was the only guy who ever asked me. He's like, dude, how do we beat you deep? Yeah. And I think that sometimes everybody has questions, but they don't want to go to the source and ask the questions. Mm -hmm. We got to mm -hmm. be willing to ask questions. That's a good word. That's yeah. a great word to wrap on, man. Listen, this is LeVon Kirkland, everyone. <laughs> Captain Kirk. Captain L. Kirk yeah, land that, hey, hey, let me tell you something. This is, this is, <laughs> I'm going to get all of y'all. I, I, at some point I'm going to get, I'm going to have gotten every last interview of, of the, well, man, I can't get KG, but God you can bless. Get Kevin. You can get, you can get Greg and um, Chad. Chad will I'm be get, happy to come on. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him, man. I would love got KG too, boy. I tell oh, you, and no. I've had so many conversations with him, but Man, what KG a what was a, a wonderful guy, man. Oh man. KG what a was the genuine one, dude. I tell you what, KG was the one who told me, like, Kirk, man, you got it all, dude. He was the first one to say, Kirk, you got it all. Come to my house and eat. You know? Um, and then, you know, we started we really started getting good, man. We started watching all four of us would watch film um as a group. And we would talk about, okay, how would you call this call? Or how would you do this? And when I started coaching, um, what I recognized was back then we would take care of each other. So 
let's say Greg, there was a counterplay and Greg would go spill it, but he's supposed to squeeze it. I'm a, I'm gonna get no, outside of it. No big deal. Yeah. I'm just I, I I'm I'm, I'm gonna replace him. I'm gonna replace, I'm gonna replace you. you. Right. Now, now Lavar is like guys don't want to do that. It's like it's on him. You should have been outside. Yeah, coach, you should have been outside. I, I, I'm supposed to do this. I'm like, as a player, you've got to take ownership. Because there's only so much a coach can really do. That's right. So, hey, dude, I used to, when guys would come off the field, I'd be like, what do you see? I can't, I mean, I'm on the sideline. I can't see all that in there. Yeah. What did you see? And they'd be like, well, I, hey, man, help your guy out, man. Like, yes. I always thought the inside linebackers are supposed to help the outside linebackers and vice versa. Uh-huh. Um, especially on run plays, because you can see it better yeah. than the guy on the line of scrimmage. Absolutely. You can so see it develop. I would always tell Kevin, Jason, I would always tell those guys, do whatever you want to do. I'm going to cover you I got up. You, you play I it got inside, you. I'm going to play it outside. You yeah, play it outside, I'm going to play it inside. Even though if it's designed for you to spill it, and yeah. you don't spill and you squeeze it, I'm right there. I'm right there. Golly. Yeah. That's and I a wish great more word. I wish more guys would to take responsibility for other guys. Um and you know, t- and say like, dude, I, I got you. Yeah. Like, you know, like one time the one of the best interceptions I ever made was me taking up for Chad. Chad had the guy, he doesn't get him. I'm like, he pressure, oh, he pressure rush. Did he, he pressure, pressure rush? And I'm like, the tight end is going down the scene. So you had to go get him. I'm hauling ass to go yeah. get him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm behind him, and I'm like, well, I can't catch him. But once he puts his hands up, I'm going to reach out. I did that. Jim Kelly hits me right there. And I pulled the interception in. But it was me taking over for another guy. And – and when I started coaching with Arizona, I didn't see that quite that much. Like, hey, man, I'm going to do this. Can you do this for me? Yeah, a little bit more selfish, a little, little bit more I mean, selfish these days. Yeah, and it's like – Unaware. It's like we played, man. We took, we took so much personal ownership of it. We took the game so much more personally, I think. That wasn't that. everywhere. No. Just so you know. Yeah. Even in our day, that was not everywhere. We definitely took ownership. I mean, yeah. it's like we took the – it's like the environment. It, and it all depends on your environment. Too. Yeah. I think that's in raising yeah. kids. You had an company. amazing – you had an amazing setup because yeah. I ain't going to lie to you. I wish I, – I wish. If you would have had that setup, oh. you would have went to the Pro Bowl. I mean, you would have went to the Hall of Fame, dude. I'm Man. telling you. You, an mm. outside backer? mm and With Pittsburgh us? and Pittsburgh. Oh, oh my forget about God. It. Yeah. But you were getting drafted too early back then, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you're, get, you're, get, you're going to get drafted. We could, we, we had no chance of getting you. Yeah. I ended up taking Plexico. So, yeah, man. But, but I remember seeing you on TV and I was like, this, this kid is a freaking monster, man. It was a product. I thought a of lot y'all. of your game, bro. You I played. Appreciate it. And I'm going to tell you what you play like. Uh, you see those kids at Georgia now? Yeah. Ooh. They them be Georgia out there Bulldogs, hunting. Them Georgia Bulldogs play like back in the day, dude. Them they dudes are straight hunting. downhill. Yes, they are. Yeah. Yes, they are. They don't play like these new linebackers. They, them dudes they, play like old school. They playing. <laughs> thumpers. I call thump them thumpers. They can thump, run thumpers. and they're going and they're going to finish. Yes. They you know finish. what we talked about the other day? We talked about them real dudes. Yeah. You know, there's some guys, and then them like, yeah, that the dude you don't want to mess with. You don't with. want that. Yeah, For you don't real. want that smoke at all. Yeah. You don't want none of that smoke. Oh. Yeah, man. that's what them that's what you I thought that you played like. Man. I was like, that boy, I appreciate that boy that. right there played like we play. Oh, I love that's, it, that's what I patterned it after. And I love oh, you back. Man. I love you back. Oh, hey, that's you, LeVon man. Kirkland. Thank it's you, LeVon bro. Kirkland, y'all. Up on Game Presents, Conversations with a Legend. This has been truly a pleasure for me. Make sure you stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe. Check out what we got going on. It's on YouTube. It's coming soon to a feed for, for Fox Sports Radio. Make sure you stay tuned for that as well. 
Uh, I'm LeVar Arrington. We're signing off. I don't want to sign off, but I'm going to sign off. One of the Steel Curtain's finest. LeVon Kirkland, y'all. Y'all be well. You've just been blessed. Y'all take care. See you next week.